and we are recording. So we are covering the respiratory system starting now. This first slide highlights the course objectives for the respiratory system. Your study guide, which is a list of questions on a Word document, which is already posted for you, do a good job of elucidating specific areas that help us achieve these course objectives. So we start every system with identifying the main reasons for having this system listed for you on the slide is by no means an exhaustive list, but it does cover the main points of the, the main functions of the respiratory system. First and foremost, gas exchange between the air and blood at the core of the respiratory system are two lungs primarily responsible for uh, bringing in oxygen. Uh, and the lungs have a close relationship with the heart by way of that pulmonary circuit we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Now, when it comes to protecting services, the respiratory system is equipped with certain features at the epithelial lining to make sure the air that we're breathing in is as clean as possible from pathogens and debris that may exist in the air that we're inhaling. I want to highlight the point number five on the slide, which is producing communication sounds. And the whole reason behind this is because the respiratory system includes the larynx, which is essentially the voice box. Uh, air has to pass through the voice box in order for you to speak. Therefore, if there is no air, you cannot speak. Ask anyone that's been on a ventilator, they cannot speak. Now, facilitating olfaction is probably the one of the most self-explanatory olfaction, if you recall, from our study of the cranial nerves in Bio 210, simply refers to the sense of smell. And at the beginning of the respiratory system is the nasal cavity responsible for helping us interpret the scents that are in our internal, that are in our external environments. Here's an overview of the respiratory system anatomy divided up divided into the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. The huge landmark here is the larynx, which is comprised of three cartilages. You'll see in a later slide, but I'm gonna highlight for you now so you can orient yourself around the schematic diagram. They are the epiglottis, the cricoid cartilage, as well as the thyroid cartilage, which you can see and palpate on your person or your patient because it's easily visible. What we look for is for that, is for that Adam's apple, which everyone has. Uh, anatomically speaking, it is referred to as a laryngeal prominent, prominence, just so you know if you ever encounter that in the literature. Anything above the larynx is considered a part of the upper respiratory system, the nose, nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, and the pharynx. Anything below the lower anything below the larynx is part of the lower respiratory system, including the trachea bronchi and the bronchial tree, including the bronchioles, and of course the alveolar of the lungs where gas exchange does occur. As a review of the paranasal sinuses, there are four bones of the, of the body, specifically the skull. They are facial and cranial bones that will have a sinus in them. These are empty spaces that help lighten the weight of the skull as it sits on C1, the first cervical vertebra, also known as the atlas. Those bones are the maxillary bone, frontal bone, ethmoid bone and sphenoid bone. And if you revisit where they are located with, within the skull, they are all located around the nasal cavity. That's why they are called the para next to nasal as a nasal cavity sinuses. Here in this image, we highlight the, where the upper respiratory system is located, again, above the larynx, and where the lower respiratory system is located, again, below the larynx. It is really important that we understand that the upper and lower respiratory system do different things, highlighted for you on this slide. And when we look at the anatomy of the respiratory system, this explains why. There are very different anatomical structures in the upper respiratory system, which is why the upper respiratory system is primarily focused on con 
is primarily focused on conducting air, bringing air from the external environment and into the respiratory system as it makes its way to the lungs. There is no gas exchange that occurs in the upper respiratory system. The lower respiratory system is where gas exchange occurs. For this reason, the lower respiratory system is also referred to the respiratory portion. Because you work with cadavers in lab, there are several structures that are worth knowing, knowing the orientation really well. What I'm, the structures I'm referring to are the trachea and the esophagus, especially important when you uh, revisit the mediastinum space in the thoracic cavity because there are three main structures there. You'll be able to differentiate those three structures if you are familiar with who is in front of who. So always, 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 the esophagus is posterior to the trachea, always, unless there is some sort of anatomical anomaly, always, the esophagus is posterior to the trachea. I would know that really well. Okay. When we come, when we get to the lungs, uh, we have two lungs. I think that's, we know that fact very well. They are structured differently because the heart sits towards the left side of the chest. The left lung can only have two lobes. It can only have space for two lobes because at some way, shape or form, it has to accommodate for the heart. The right lung has three lobes. Because of that, the right lung will have two fissures because it has to separate three lobes and the left lung will only have two fissures, sorry, one fissure because it only needs to separate two lobes. Now we are going to hone in on the upper respiratory tract anatomy. Beginning with the external nares, the external nares is simply the entrance of the respiratory system. At the dinner table, we refer to these as the nostrils. On a medical chart note, we refer to them as the external nares. They're simply the first entrance. It's basically the first structure that air passes through as it, as it makes its way from the external environment and into the respiratory system. Air then sits or hangs out in the nasal vestibule for just a little bit, often uh, referred to as the lobby of the respiratory system. Here, there is a lot of filtration that occurs. Uh, there's lots of hairs in the nasal vestibule, and this explains why if you're ever curious as to what is beyond the nostrils and you pick and poke at that area, you might find quite a bit of gunk. And that's because the nasal vestibule is responsible for filtering the air out of particulates and pathogens to the best of its ability. The nasal septum is found in between the right and left nasal cavity. It has contributions from perpendicular plates of the ethmoid bone as well as the vomer bone. In the right and left nasal cavity are a series of nasal conchae which protrude into the nasal cavity and the grooves underneath the conchae are their respective nasal meatuses. There are, hopefully you saw on the cadavers or will see in the next, in the next few weeks, there are, there's a superior, middle and inferior conchae and meatus. Typically from superior to inferior, the conchae comes first, then the meatus, then the conchae and then the meatus and they're named superior superior, middle, and inferior based on terms of direction. The hard palate and the soft palate located here and here, if you're following my cursor on the slide, these, this structure separates the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. The hard palate is called the hard palate because it is comprised of bone, specifically maxillary bone and palatine bone. And then as, it, as you move posteriorly, uh, we transition to a softer tissue. That's why we call it the soft palate. And then most at the most posterior aspect of the soft palate is the uvula. This structure is what we see hanging down, looking like a punching bag, when we have our patients open their mouth and say, ah, as we try and look towards the back of their throat. This is the structure that is often misconstrued as the palatine tonsils. I mentioned to you several weeks ago when we talked about the tonsils as part of the lymphatic system. Beyond the nasal cavity, 
is the internal nares. And this is the last stop that air has before it moves down the pharynx, which is a shared region between the nasal cavity, oral cavity, and the larynx. And so that's why the pharynx is divided into three regions, known as the nasopharynx behind the nasal cavity, the oropharynx behind the oral cavity, and the laryngopharynx behind the larynx. The nasal cavity, where you find the nasal conchae and meatus, are primarily res uh, responsible for warming and humidifying the air. This is what, this is the type of air that moves really well and easily through the respiratory system. And uh, it is most comfortable for your lungs to receive warm and moist air. And when, when you think about it now, if you know anybody who struggles with asthma or a lung disorder, maybe you struggle with asthma, uh, most patients with lung issues do not do well in cold, dry air, which is why humidifiers become really helpful for them, especially if they live in places where there are long winter months, which essentially is cold, dry air. I wanna also emphasize the importance of the pharynx as a shared space. This pharynx being a shared space explains why after a bout of nasal congestion, a lot of patients feel uh, what we report as post-nasal drip. How we feel that or how patients feel that is a sore throat, maybe a mild cough that comes after a, an episode of runny run nose rhinorrhea or nasal congestion. And that's because when there's mucus buildup in the nasal cavity, all that mucus buildup uh, is discomforting one because you've got all this buildup in a small amount of space basically creates a pressurized area, which is not, not comfortable. And so what's alleviating is to find a way to relieve this mucus, get mucus to exit from the nasal cavity. Ideally, we want it to exit through the external nares. This is where blowing the nose comes into play. Uh, that's not always the case, as you may very well know from your own experiences with nasal congestion and maybe about the common cold. So if, it, if mucus cannot exit through the external nares, then it will exit by way of the posterior opening, which is down the nasopharynx and into the oropharynx, which happens to be behind the oral cavity. There is also a connection between the ears right and left to the right and left nasal cavity respectively. Uh, there is a tube called the auditory tube. And this structure here, just posterior to the internal nares is the entrance to the auditory tube. This is where the right auditory tube drains into the right nasal cavity and the left auditory is, it's also where the left auditory tube drains into the left nasal cavity. This explains why after a severe ear infection where there's lots of buildup of fluid in the ear, uh, patients often may report some nasal symptoms because that tube brought some of that fluid that was in the ear into the nasopharynx because of this entrance to the auditory tube. Okay, so I've mentioned the importance of the nasal uh, conchae and nasal meatus already. Let's hone in on the defense system that the respiratory has as it brings air in. Air is not always the cleanest, uh, unfortunately, and so it helps that the respiratory system has certain features in place to make the air uh, less harmful as it first is when it enters the respiratory system. Uh, mucus contains an enzyme called lysozyme, I would know really well. It is responsible uh, for trapping particles and killing bacteria that make their way into the respiratory system. The respiratory system also has an, also has an antimicrobial protein known as defensin. Uh, they will work to kill microbes in a nonspecific fashion not the most effective, but it's part of the first line of defense. And if you revisit uh, the concept of innate and humoral immunity, this is where hopefully you can figure out and elucidate where defensins and lysozymes would come in in the big scheme of immune system function.
Okay. Mucus is always being produced uh, when there is pending infection, infection that is brewing, the respiratory system will produce more of this fluid we know as mucus. Uh, and while it is inconveniencing, it, while it's uncomfortable and annoying, it actually is part of our body's way of uh, protecting itself because the whole idea is mucus is sticky, right? And so that mucus will trap as much, uh, as much pathogens that are in the air so that they don't make it down to the lower respiratory system where it can cause bigger issues if it's exposed to the lungs. Ooh, skip the slide here. The mucos, the mucociliary escalator. Please know this really well. It is a physiological concept, really important for respiratory system function and the defense system found the respiratory system. So if you recall back in bio 210, the respiratory system is, is where you'll find ciliated pseudo stratified columnar epithelium. Once again, ciliated, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And the presence of cilia, these hair-like extensions on the apical surface of epithelium work with mucus. The cilia basically move in an escalator type fashion, mucus from a, from a posterior, from the posterior end, just kidding, the inferior end of the respiratory system up towards the superior end of the respiratory system to keep bacteria and pathogens from descending down to lower respiratory system where it's sequelae and where, where it will have more significant ramifications. Okay, so uh, a little bit more about what happens to air in the nasal cavity when air comes in, it swirls around in the maze that's formed by the nasal concha and meatuses. Remember, there are three pairs, superior of, there's a superior uh, concha followed by meatus, middle uh, concha and then me, middle meatus, and then the inferior concha and inferior meatus. So that maze in the nasal cavity will allow air to swirl around and warm and humidify itself in the process. Epistaxis is a term here that's underlined. It is the way that we medically chart a nosebleed. Um, and typically we see patients who are more prone to nosebleeds because the nasal conchimatuses are not doing a sufficient enough job of warming and humidifying the air that's coming in the nasal cavity. And so it causes a lot of dryness and that dryness will be a trigger for the fine capillaries in the nasal cavity to, uh, to burst, which will then lead to uh, an episode of epistaxis, an episode of nose bleeding. Okay, so I've mentioned the slide for you already earlier on. It's here for you in written form. Should you just should you uh, decide to revisit it? I've already covered the significance of the pharynx. Here you see an image color coded for you showing uh, showing the landmark. So. Uh, what I tell my students in lab is to look for the soft palate, so specifically the uvula that typically marks the inferior end of the nasopharynx and the superior end of the oropharynx. And then I ask them to look for the superior tip of the epiglottis that marks the inferior end of the oropharynx and the superior end of the laryngopharynx. The larynx, here you go, are, here are the three cartilages of the larynx, bolded for a reason, please know really well. I would also recommend that we are familiar with who, which of these cartilages, what type of cartilages we're, we're looking at here. And I'll tell you, thyroid and cricoid are both hyaline, which, and hyaline is the most common form of cartilage, if you recall, from bio 210. Epiglottis is not, and it cannot be hyaline. It's got to be elastic cartilage because epiglottis, the epiglottis structure moves depending or not, depending on whether or not there is food matter in the oral cavity. I will explain more in just a little bit.
So the larynx is attached to the hyoid bone, if you recall, as part of the axial skeleton, and it is inferiorly continuous with the trachea, which is that airway that descends, uh, basically begins the lower respiratory tract. The larynx has three functions to provide an open airway uh, because it one of the cartilages is the epiglottis. It's responsible for switch, a switching mechanism for food and air, and of course, and of course, voice production. So let's discuss now the importance of the epiglottis. To do that, I'm going to come to this slide here. So here's the epiglottis. That red arrow is pointing to the epiglottis here. So recall that the pharynx is a shared space, right? And so while air, well, when air is coming in, when you, air, we're breathing every day, right? We're breathing every, pretty much every second. So air is continuously entering the respiratory system and the pharynx by way of the nasal cavity. When it's time to feed, when it's eating time, food will enter the oral cavity and it will be pushed because of the swallowing uh, function past the uvula and into the oropharynx. Herein lies a challenge because food being comprised of mass, uh, gravity is what will bring food matter down, inferior, and food will follow the path of least resistance. So there are two openings here. Recall that the epi the esophagus, excuse me, the esophagus is always located posterior to the trachea, so the epiglottis, one more time, is posterior to the trachea. The epiglottis is the tube that we want food to travel down because the esophagus will connect the oral cavity to the stomach, uh, which is the next organ of the digestive system we'll talk more about in several lectures. However, there is this opening to the trachea. And the problem is the opening to the trachea is generally larger than the opening to the esophagus. And because food matter follows the path of least resistance, it will likely enter the opening of the trachea, which is a problem because the respiratory system is a closed system. There is, once things enter the lung, there is no way out. And that would obviously be a problem. So what the epiglottis does is when there is food matter in the oral cavity, the epiglottis will move, and it can because it's comprised of elastic cartilage. It will move to a position such that it lays on top of the opening to the trachea, thereby blocking it, and so then there's only one tube that food can descend, and that would be the esophagus, which is what we ideally want to happen. So if you think back to all the times you maybe tried to eat and talk at the same time, you may have experienced a bout of choking. And what happens in choking is basically the epiglottis did not get its act together in time. The epiglottis cannot do one, cannot do more than one thing at one time. So when it's, when you're trying to speak, of, in which the epiglottis is important for the larynx, because it's one of the cartilages that makes, that makes up the larynx and you also swallowed food at the same time, basically the epiglottis uh, freezes in paralysis because it didn't know what to do. It can't do more than two things at one time. And so because it lagged, then the opening to the trachea was exposed and open. And so that food matter entered the opening of the trachea. Now, around the opening of the trachea are lots of nerve reflexes, which will initiate a coughing response. And that's ideal because when we cough, it basically results in food matter, any food matter entering the opening of the trachea, it gets pushed out. And in that coughing reflex, it basically gave, bought the epiglottis time to get its act together so that the epiglottis truly moves into a close into a position where it's closing the trachea and then food can travel down the esophagus which is what it was supposed to do in the first place so that is a very significant role that the epiglottis has please know really well let's move on now to the larynx i won't belabor the larynx what i'll say are following are the following take home statements because we can have a whole conversation on the larynx alone it is a fascinating organ uh 
The larynx has a pair of vocal, a true vocal cords and false vocal cords that are really beyond the scope of this class. I just mentioned this to you so that you are aware of this very fact. Now, the, there is a pair of vocal cords that are basically ligaments because we're connecting um, cartilage to cartilage uh, uh, and then because the hyoid bone is involved, uh, bone to bone. Now there's lots of muscles around these vocal cords that are comprised of ligaments and essentially uh, vocalists who uh, undergo training, this is their musical instrument, right? And so vocalists uh, train the larynx in such a way where they have so much control over the muscles and the vocal cords themselves, such that they're able to attain specific pitches, pitches that the untrained larynx is incapable of. It really is a fascinating thing that is all I'll say about the larynx for the purposes of this class. So we've approached the larynx. We basically covered all the structures in the upper respiratory system. Now we're going to delve into the structures that are found in the lower respiratory system. And as we're talking about the upper versus lower respiratory system anatomical structures, I want you to start thinking about the sorts of symptoms that you would expect in a lower respiratory system infection versus an upper respiratory system infection, it will explain why we have to differentiate between, like if we suspect that a patient has a respiratory system infection, we have to differentiate between upper versus lower. We don't treat those the same way because they have very different anatomical structures. So the first structure inferior to the larynx is the airway, the trachea. The trachea, it has C-shaped cartilaginous rings comprised of hyaline cartilage. They are C-shaped, meaning they are not closed at the posterior end. The posterior end has smooth muscle, and typically with smooth muscle, it has a close relationship with the sympathetic nervous system. That's important. This, this muscle the smooth muscle is known as the tracheallus muscle, found again on the posterior aspect of the trachea. It will help the, tr the trachea constrict or narrow or widen to help control the amount of air that is traveling through the trachea as the air makes their way to the right and left lung. This brings us to the bronchial tree. So, the bronchial tree is essentially the network of airway passages that air will need to travel to as it makes its way from the trachea to a specific lobe in the right or left lung. At the base of the trachea is a, an important landmark. It's called the carina. That's this word here, C-A-R-I-N-A. -A. Not only does it mark the inferior end of the trachea, it also marks where the primary bronchi begin. There are only two primary bronchi. There's a right primary bronchus directing air into the right lung and a left primary bronchus directing air to the left lung. At when the primary bronchus enters the lung, it will then divide into smaller secondary bronchi. And there's going to be one secondary bronchi for each lobe of the lung. So because the, the right lung has three lobes, the right lung will have three secondary bronchi. And because the left lung only has two lobes, there will only be two secondary bronchi. For the primary bronchi, right and left, it is worth knowing, and boxed in red for you, that the right primary bronchus is wider, shorter, and steeper than the left particularly important for patients who uh, inhaled a foreign object, common in the infant's population. It's one of the most common reasons for why parents bring their infants in to urgent care or the ER. When we suspect a foreign object inhalation, time is of the essence. We're potentially looking at airway obstruction here. And so because we know that the right primary bronchus is wider, shorter, and more steep, more vertical than the left, chances that gravity dis 
that gravity pushed that foreign object into the right primary bronchus is significantly higher than chances it entered the left primary bronchus. The left primary bronchus can't be as deep because that heart is in the way, right? That heart sits towards the left side of the chest. So that left primary bronchus cannot be nearly as deep as the right primary bronchus. So to save time and to be efficient, we look at the right primary bronchus first if we suspect a foreign object inhalation. Uh, after secondary bronchi, that airway branches into even smaller bronchi called the tertiary bronchi. The tertiary bronchi are uh, found within each lobe because there are fissures that separate one lobe from another. Uh, you won't see tertiary bronchi in between, uh, in, in two different lobes. They remain only within one lobe and each lobe will have their own sets of tertiary bronchi. After tertiary bronchi, that airway loses cartilage, and that's how we know we have reached the bronchioles. The bronchioles have a uh, layer of smooth muscle, really important for uh, patients with asthma, patients who have a lung disorder, uh, an obstructive airway disorder, because medication, this is where we have lots of control over how much air can enter. And so albuterol, often referred to as the inhaler provides pretty fast relief for patients who were experiencing an asthma attack will work on the bronchioles because that's where the smooth muscles are and smooth muscles will have a relationship with the sympathetic nervous system. After the bronchioles, they become even smaller, the airway that is, they become terminal bronchioles. And then we enter the respiratory zone where we start thinking about gas exchange. So at the very end of the bronchial system, our respiratory bronchioles, they are located right next to the alveolar sacs and the alveolar ducts that connect the alveolar sacs. And this is where gas exchange will occur. As we get to the alveoli, keep in mind that we're preparing, we're preparing for gas exchange. And so we will need uh, simple squamous epithelium to allow for easy diffusion. All right, here is an x-ray with a foreign object inhalation. Here is a schematic image for you of the bronchial tree and how it branches into their respective, uh, their respective segments. Here is a close-up of, of the respiratory zone where gas exchange will occur. Here's a schematic of the alveolar sac. And that brings us to a revisit to uh, the bronchioles. So um, bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction are both uh, in bold uh, because we're going to really want you to be familiar with them. Bronchodilation is simply a widening of the bronchial airways. This is what uh, this is what the inhaler will do. Uh, albuterol, that is, and then bronchoconstriction will constrict, narrow the bronchi. Okay, so bronco can so in bronchodilation, this is caused by sympathetic nervous system activity, and this is again, uh, if you recall, in the fight or flight mode, when you are trying to run away from a tiger or fight the tiger, you're going to want bronchodilation because you're going to need more air to bring to the cardiovascular system because you are increasing metabolic activity. Now, if sympathetic nervous system is some is uh, responsible for bronchodilation, then the parasympathetic nervous system is going to be closely affiliated with bronchoconstriction. Also affiliated with bronchoconstriction is the allergic response uh, that's mediated by histamine. So histamine, if you recall, will make the capillary walls more permeable. It will also cause bronchoconstriction, which explains why when you are having a bout of a seasonal allergy or a seasonal allergy episode, you uh, sneeze frequently because it's that reflex reaction to bronchoconstriction, which is a result of histamine release. Okay, so on this slide basically summarizes for you what I've been tying in to what, we, to what we're talking about in the clinical context of asthma. Albuterol is that medication it's typically found in an in inhaler form. It will bind to beta two 
uh, receptors causing bronchodilation. And so uh, beyond the scope of the class, but worth mentioning anyway, in case you know anybody who is on an albuterol inhaler, you're not supposed to use this more than one time per day. If you are, your asthma is not well managed, you should probably talk to your doctor about that. And the reason why is because albuterol is supposed to be used as needed in severe cases of an asthma episode that you maybe did not anticipate. The reason why we don't want our patients taking albuterol more than one time per day is because it also acts on beta-1 receptors on the heart, which will increase heart rate. So when patients come in and we're managing asthma and they complain, I'm noticing that their pulse is increased compared to the last time I saw them, I will ask them how often they are taking their albuterol inhaler because chances are they're taking it more than once. And that is a, uh, that I will definitely want to do something about that because it's not worth increasing heart rate in an effort to give you more air. There are other ways to do that without affecting the heart this way. All right, so last couple of slides on this PowerPoint set. Honing in all the alveoli where gas exchange occurs. There are two types of cells, type one pneumocytes and type two pneumocytes. Pneumo as in lung, site meaning cell, Simply put, uh, simply translated, these are cells that are found in the alveoli of the lung. So type one cells are simply the simple squamous cells that we find lining the alveolar sacs, the alveoli, which is which forms part of the respiratory membrane. We'll talk more about, I believe, in the second slide set. There are type two pneumocytes and they produce a really important substance known as surfactant. Bolded for a reason, please know it. Uh, surfactant is important for decreasing surface tension in the alveoli. Why is this important? Well, uh, there are, uh, because the alveoli tissue is very fragile, it really only is made of simple squamous epithelium. It is one cell layer thick. With all the respiration, all the diffusion that's happening, it is easy for the alveoli to, co to collapse without surfactants because of all the surface tension that overtakes or overrides the strength of the simple squamous epithelium that would obviously be a problem. So surface, what surfactant does, it is, it's a fluid that decreases surface tension. If you feel so inclined, there's a few, there's a few review slides that have to do with chem chemistry concepts, specifically hydrogen bonding that you find in water. The hydrogen bonds are the re in between water molecules are the reason for why surface tensions, surface tension is an issue in the alveoli of the lungs. Recall that water is the universal solvent. And so you'll see it around the alveoli would be an issue if it weren't for the presence of surfactants. And this is the, this is one of the main reasons for why we are concerned for infants or for babies who are born premature, if, especially if they are born before I believe week 30, 32 of pregnancy. While all their organs have been fully developed and yes, they can survive, at that point in time, they don't have enough surfactant that they're producing on their own. So in the event that mom gets pushed into early, into early labor, um, that, that infant is going to be closely monitored for the next several weeks because we are going to likely need to facilitate, uh, with, facilitate with oxygen supply as his or her body, as we buy his or, his or her body time to produce enough surfactant to a point where they don't need to depend on, on an external oxygen supply to survive. The lack of surfactant is the reason behind respiratory distress syndrome in premature infants. That brings us to the end of this slide set. Are there any questions that I can answer for you about that material? Feel free to unmute. I'll give you all a minute as you uh, think about any questions for me. And if not, I will get us jump started on the second slide set. 
Hi, I don't have a question on the material, but the part one PowerPoint isn't in the announcement. It isn't? All right. I'm going to put a quick note in there uh, to make sure. I may have missed the publish button, but I will get that up there for you. I apologize. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, are, there aren't... Hey, Cynthia, is the part two PowerPoint showing? The part two is on there. Is it on your announcement has part two and like the study guide again? Okay, I must have missed the uh, the button. So I will make sure I press the button before um, I get on with my weekend, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. I've got uh, a little bit of time. So what I'll do without, belay without overwhelming you all, at least that's the goal anyway, is we will kind of explore the concept of alveoli a little bit more. I have a question. Yes. So for rigid? the so for the um beta 2 receptors, aren't those on skeletal muscle, which creates like tremors with albuterol? Uh yes, they are also so beta 2 receptors are found in multiple parts of the body. Okay. And so there's so uh, so, that, so to simply put, yes. And so it's another thing that we look for in patients who are overdosing albuterol. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Great comment. All right. Let's... Part two. All right. I'm going to share my slide. All right. I'm assuming that since my previous slide set showed up on my screen, oops, this is the wrong one. Go figure. Okay, let's try this one more time. Okay, I'm gonna say a couple more things about alveoli and then we'll call it, we'll call it a week. So um, histology, we're gonna revisit a little bit again. So as a review, here's the alveoli sac, okay? What's tied in with the alveoli sac is going to be the respiratory bronchioles. That's basically the most distal end of the bronchial tree. What we're entering here, what we're, what we're honing in on here are, is the respiratory membrane. So here you find all the capillaries that are part of the pulmonary circuit. They are gonna be responsible for taking in oxygen from the alveoli of the lungs. And then in exchange, these capillaries are going to, uh, to deliver carbon dioxide from the deoxygenated blood that came from the right side of the heart, if you recall from the pulmonary circuit, push that carbon dioxide into the alveolar sac so that we can breathe that carbon dioxide out. Here should be a review of uh, alveoli, specifically simple squamous epithelium. So all of this is simple squamous epithelium representing the alveoli. Here you can see the alveoli sacs. Uh, and then the, what this is also representing is the respiratory, the respiratory bronchioles, the terminal, the distal end of the bronchial tree. How we differentiate uh, bronchioles, specifically primary, secondary, and tertiary, is we look for the presence of cartilage. And that's exactly what we see here, indicating a small bronchus. Bronchioles will, will have lost their cartilage, so you will see smooth muscle like we do here. Okay. This brings us to the respiratory membrane, which was the last piece of concept that I wanted to talk about today um, because it ties very well in with our, with our discussion on the alveoli. So the respiratory membrane is, are basically the, the players involved in gas exchange. There are three layers I would know oh so well. Uh, you're gonna have the, sim the simple squamous epithelial cells in the alveoli. And then you're going to have the 
endothelial cells also comprise of simple squamous epithelium in the capillaries of the vessels that are part of the pulmonary circuit. So here is a really good representation for you of the respiratory membrane. Here you see uh, carbon dioxide leaving the blood and oxygen entering the blood as it's, and then it will make its way back to the left side of the heart, which will then be fed to the systemic circuit of the cardiovascular system. In between, what's keeping the simple squamous cells of the alveolus, uh, alveoli and the simple squamous cells of the capillary together is a fused basement membrane, a fused basement membrane. This ensures maximum diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide because this is key and critical for life. Uh, and this actually ties in very well with how we understand epithelium tissue. You know you're looking at epithelium tissue because there should be an apical surface and a basal surface, right? The basal surface will have that basement membrane that's essentially what's fusing the simple squamous epithelium of the capillary and the alveoli together. And it so works out such that on the other end of the simple squamous epithelium of the alveoli, is a lumen open space where air will be where air will be found and then also on the capillary side on the apical surface of the capillary you will have a lumen through which blood will travel through so these are the three components of the respiratory membrane are there any questions about the respiratory membrane Great. Well, if there aren't any questions, that is all I have for you today. The other concepts I'm going to leave to when I see you all on Wednesday because it gets a little gets a little involved, um, and we're gonna likely gonna have we're likely gonna have conversations um, that are best done in person. So thank you all for being here. I will make sure this recording is available to you and to your classmates who are not able to join us this evening. I will make sure you have access to PowerPoint slide set number one of the respiratory system. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.